I wanted to share today uh, about a very personal question that I, that I have felt the Lord asking me the last few days. Um, and I want to start in Hebrews 12, if you want to turn there, Hebrews 12. The past couple of weeks have been interesting for our family as we've been dealing with various sickness and things like that. And, um, but the Lord is faithful to speak to us and encourage us and challenge us in such times. So I want to share a little bit of what the Lord has <clears throat> spoken to me very personally. Um, Hebrews 12, verse 27. You can look with me there, please. Or in verse 26, actually, we start there. It says, his voice shook the earth then, but now he's promised saying, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken of created things so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. And uh, the past couple of weeks, I would say, have involved a little bit of unexpected shaking in my life. And as it says here, the removal of the things which can be shaken. And the Lord promises here, in a way, if you look with me at Hebrews 12, that the things which can be shaken will be removed. He wants to remove the things that can be removed so that only that which cannot be shaken may remain. And so the question that the Lord's been asking me um, in these last couple of weeks is very simply, where is your worth? Where is your identity? And uh, it's, we think we know the answer to that question, but sometimes the shaking comes and all of a sudden you go, Hey, there's something moving here. I thought this was a sturdy table, but I, but if I hit it over here, all of a sudden there's a wobble. And I've, I've been reminded of brother Zach. He's said a few times I've heard, I've heard him say, um, I could be in a hospital bed. I could never preach another sermon, but I'd still be a worshiper. And, you know, I've heard that, I don't know, 10 times probably. And you know what I think whenever I hear that? I think, me too. <laughs> me too. And you know what the Lord said to me this last couple of weeks? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Uh, lovingly, in, in tenderness. I don't mean that, that he's being sarcastic, not at all. But it's one thing to hear somebody say, hey, if I'm in a hospital bed, no problem. I'm still a worshiper. And go, oh, yeah, me too. Definitely. Sign me up for that. But then the Lord says, okay, I just signed you up for this little course. Is it secure? What's shaking? And I've discovered many things in the last couple of weeks that I can place worth in. I can place identity in. And I'm not even aware of it until it's removed. And, I, and that word remove is actually the word that stuck with me. It says the expression yet once more denotes the removing of things that can be shaken. And sometimes the Lord removes certain things. And I just noticed even, I just wrote down a little list. This is just my list. But I'll tell you what it reveals is what's shakeable still. And there's a lot that's still shakeable. Um, there's a lot of things that we can place worth in. Maybe, and for me, here's a few things. My ownership of certain projects or client relationships. What happens when all of a sudden the work's got to move on without me? Am I shaken? My productivity, I put worth, I realize my productivity. What happens when you can't think clearly? Is there shaking at all? Uh, I really like being responsive. That's something I kind of pride myself in. I don't have many unread messages. What happens when the messages pile up? You know, um, Even my pleasure. What happens when you can't taste something? Are you disappointed? Feel like, man, this meal is kind of a waste of time, you know. Um, your plans, what if you have plans to do certain things and your plans get canceled? All of a sudden, you don't think what uh, is there disappointment that comes in? They're shaking. Maybe I want to, maybe I place worth or value in connecting with my kids, reading stories. What if you get winded? What if you don't feel like reading? Right? Is there shaking that happens? What about how your body feels? What about enjoying being outside? What if you're told you can't go outside? shaking. I'm just, I'm, I'm giving you, these aren't hypotheticals. This is just my list, right? What about being helpful? What about having a good attitude? The removal of things which can be shaken. Lord's removing. What about consistency in God's word? I found I need more sleep. And you know, one of the things that suffered is being able to just spend time in God's word. 
Am I shaken? What about victory? Being an overcomer. What about when, 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 my, uh, when I snap a little bit more quickly than I'd like? Is that my worth? Is that my identity? There's so many things. All that say, I could go on. There's a much longer list. But the point is, there's all sorts of things that we can subtly derive our worth from. That question, where's your worth? Where's your value? And God wants to remove everything. This verse says, this denotes the removing of things that can be shaken, of created things, so that only that which cannot be shaken may remain. The Lord wants to remove everything so that Christ might be all. He might be all in all. He might be preeminent. And when the things that can be shaken are removed, when the things that can be removed are removed, am I shaken? That's the question. Am I shaken? Or do I have a deposit of that which cannot be shaken? It says, if you look with me in Hebrews 12, verse 28, it says, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, and then he goes on, but just stop right there. It says, we who are Christ's are meant to receive something that cannot be shaken. And I found it's good in these times like this to, to ask myself and to honestly allow the Lord to search my heart and say, have I received something unshakable? I discover the answer to that question when that which can be removed is removed. What does God intend to be the unshakable part of my life? Is it my responsiveness at work? Is it my helpfulness at home? Is it my consistency in God's word? Is it overcoming sin? Is it my productivity? Is it my connection with my kids? What is that unshakable thing? <clears throat> I was reminded of a promise that God made to in the Old Covenant in Jeremiah chapter 33. I want to, and the Lord has really encouraged me and challenged me with this. I want this to be my testimony. And family, I'm definitely a work in progress. Um, it says, if you look with me at Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse. 14, this is a new covenant promise about what God's intention, God's telling his people what it's going to be like in the new covenant when he establishes a new covenant with his people. It says in Jeremiah 33, verse 14, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good word that I've spoken concerning the house of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth and he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell in safety. And look at this. This is their identity. This is their name. This is their worth. The Lord is our righteousness. God's desire from of old and his vision and his goal for the in the new covenant is that my identity might be completely swallowed up in Jesus Christ and who he is. This is the name that shall be called. The Lord's our righteousness. Can you imagine saying, hey, you know, uh, little boy, what's your name? My name is my daddy loves me. No, 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 that's not your name. What's your name? My daddy protects me. No, what's your name? My daddy always looks out for me. There's nothing of him left. And what the Lord has said here is the name by which his people will be called in the New Testament has nothing to do with them and everything to do with him. And the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul, he takes us, he, he expounds on it a little bit in 1 Corinthians in chapter 1. And this is the same idea, but I, I like how he expanded on it here. <clears throat> he says in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30, but by his doing, you are in Christ, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He's everything to us. That's what it says to me. God put you in Christ Jesus, that your entire identity, your entire worth, your entire everything would be in Jesus Christ. And sometimes, you know what he does? He removes the things that can be removed to show me, I think my identity is in Christ, but 
I'm disappointed that my plans got canceled. I think my identity is in Christ, but I'm bummed that I'm not really connecting. I'm not having good nighttime conversations with my wife. I think my identity is in Christ, but I sure feel crummy that I can't follow through with all those sales, you know, leads that I initiated, you know, and on and on and on. I think my identity is in Christ, but I'm just in a funk because I didn't get a chance to read the Bible as long as I'd like to. Is it? Is Christ my everything? Or have I started becoming concerned? And by the way, none of the things I just mentioned are bad things. We should be productive at work. We should connect with our spouse. We should be responsible parents. But what if the Lord, is, as we were even mentioning earlier, what if the Lord in his sovereign purpose has removed these things to show me, is Jesus everything to me? You say, when you hear a, man, a godly man say, you can you know, put me in a hospital bed, I'm still a worshiper. And you say, me too. No way. You're so far from true worship where Jesus Christ is everything to you. You know, like Habakkuk says, the fig tree doesn't blossom. There's no fruit on the vine. But what? I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. And for me, I think it's so easy to think about being fruitful. You know, Jesus said in John 15, maybe we can look there. He said, by this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. And we, we, we love that. We love thinking about being fruitful. But, you know, one of the things that the Lord has put on my heart this week is the vine or the branch doesn't glory in its fruit. The branch only glories in the vine. The true branch of Jesus Christ is indifferent to fruit, not because fruit doesn't matter, not because God doesn't promise fruit, but because the fruit is his, it's the vine's job. My job as a branch is remain in me. Jesus, that's what Jesus says. Verse five, John 15, verse five, I'm the vine, you're the branch. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing, nothing. So all these things, if I start if I get the order wrong, I'm in trouble. And the Lord is showing me how he's willing to remove even good things so that he can show me, am I happy being a branch in the vine? Or as long as I have fruit, it doesn't really matter if I'm in the vine or not. I want fruit. Do I want fruit or do I want the vine? I want the vine. I want to be swallowed up in him. I want all my identity. It says in Colossians 3, verse 3, he says, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And he says, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, you will be revealed. Is Christ, can I say that Christ is my life? That's Colossians 3, 3. That Jesus Christ is my life. He's all of it. He's every bit of it. And I was reminded of how when... Um, John the Baptist came onto the scene. It says that he is uh, in, in Luke chapter three in verse four, it says, as it's written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, the voice of one calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And how does he prepare the way? It says, make his path straight. Every ravine will be filled and every mountain and hill will be leveled. He wants to level. He wants to remove Every, everything in which I am glorying or putting any kind of worth in, anything where I derive worth outside of Jesus Christ has to be leveled, even good things, especially good things. Do I think this boundary is outside of God's control? It's not at all. Do I have to be discouraged or disheartened that I can't read so much? I shouldn't be. If Jesus Christ were my everything, I wouldn't be. If Jesus Christ were my everything, my unproductivity wouldn't bother me. If Jesus Christ were my everything, my lack of enjoying food wouldn't bother me. My canceled plans wouldn't disappoint me. My need for more sleep would be as welcome as every other gift from his hand. Even my failure would just reinforce my nothingness. My problem is Jesus Christ isn't really everything to me. It's why I'm so bothered by my failure. It's why I'm so bothered by my need for more sleep. It's why I'm so bothered by my canceled plans. And the removal of the shakable things wouldn't bother the one who cannot be shaken. 
And I've seen how far I am from that claim of being a true worshiper, but I want to be. I want to be a true worshiper. And um, just like, you know, Matthew 7, we've often considered how, um, how there are many in the final day, Jesus says, who will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? And he says, depart from me, because it didn't, it didn't come from, this is verse um, 23, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who's, who comes with all these things will, it won't come from a relationship with me. It's possible that there are going to be people with lots of good works, yet without Christ. All the stuff I'm bothered by not having, yet they don't have Jesus. And it's also possible that there will be people with very little outward to show, but they have Jesus. And sometimes the removal of these outward things, even the removal of the fruit that I like or whatever it is, the Lord allows it to show me you don't really have Jesus. You have Jesus plus, but Jesus plus is another gospel. Jesus Christ must be everything to me or he's nothing to me. And it's really hard to interact with that truth. But if I will interact with it, if I'll humble myself and say, Lord, you've appointed this boundary to show me you aren't my everything. And you want to be, you know, it's what it's as, as I read in Jeremiah 33. They shall be called the Lord is my righteousness. God's goal is that his identity is my everything. So what do I do? I, um, what do I do when I realize I have a Jesus plus? I have to go back to the beginning. I have to confess that I'm putting value in other things. And I have to forsake those other things. I have to say, Lord, it doesn't matter if I don't ever, if I'm never productive again. If I'm never responsive again, if I never have a good connection with my kids again, if I never go through the whole list of things that were gained to me and say, Lord, I want to count them as loss in what? In view of knowing you, you have to be everything to me. And if I really am one with you, I believe that you'll cause the fruit to, to abound to your glory for your sake in your time. But I don't have to concern myself with those things. Lord, I just want to be with you. And that's what Paul says in Philippians 3. Whatever things were gained to me, I have come to consider them as loss. I am counting. I'm constantly counting everything as loss compared to the priceless privilege, or as the Amplified Bible says, the overwhelming preciousness of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, and becoming progressively more deeply and intimately acquainted with him. Lord, I want to be found in you and only you. I want you to be my everything. I'm not, and it says, I, I don't want to have any righteousness of my own, but the, only that which is through faith in Jesus Christ. So I have to confess it. I have to do some accounting, as Paul does there in Philippians 3. The other thing I have to do is I have to draw near to God. That's one of the things the Lord's been laying on my heart again and again. Hebrews 4, 16. Let us draw near to the throne of grace. One of the enemy's most common tactics I've observed is to use an awareness of my lack to be a cause for creating distance between me and the Lord. It's a reason for me. It's, it's so ironic. But the fact that Jesus isn't everything to me can become a reason for me to stay away from him. Oh, no, he's not everything. I got to clean up my act. I got to resolve. And what, and what the Lord reminded me of there in Hebrews 4 is... Jesus Christ paid such an incredible price for me to draw near. Don't despise the price he paid. It says there, we have a verse 14, we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens. So let's hold fast our confession. We don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weakness, but one who's been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. So for that reason, because he paid such an unbelievable price let us draw near with confidence. Don't let the enemy get you to believe this realization of your lack is reason to stay away. It's not. And then the third thing that I, that I say I, I, I've learned I need to do is choose to praise God now. We've heard, we know God loves a cheerful giver. We've often thought about that. I was blessed to consider God loves a cheerful receiver too. Whatever comes into my life, will I receive it cheerfully 
Say, this is the day. Today, this day is the day the Lord has made. So I will rejoice. I'll choose to rejoice. It doesn't say I'll feel like rejoicing. It says I'll choose to rejoice and be glad in it. And I was really encouraged by that Psalm, Psalm 69. It says, in verse uh, 29, it says, I am afflicted and in pain. May your salvation, O God, set me securely on high. So I'm afflicted and in pain. That's the context here. I will praise the name of God with song and magnify him with thanksgiving and praising him with song when I'm afflicted and in pain will please the Lord better than an ox or a young bull with horns and hooves. I'm going to trust that right now choosing to praise you, Lord, is a way that I can please you. It brings you glory. It honors you. It magnifies you because I say, Lord, thy will be done. My idea for how to make this the best day possible was all these things. I will cheerfully receive your idea for the best day possible. I want to be a cheerful receiver. None of these temporal circumstances can keep me from the Lord. None. But the Lord wants to, he appoints them and he allows them to reveal where I lack. And so I praise God for the shaking. I praise him for the um, removal of things that can be removed. He says, I will remove. So we should expect it. He will remove the things that can be removed so that only that which cannot be shaken remains. So praise the Lord for the opportunity to see other sources of worth, sources of identity. Praise the Lord for the reminder that he says in Jeremiah 33, they shall be called the Lord as a righteousness. All their identity will be in me. And um, I, I, my testimony is Lord has used this situation to convince me more and more that he and he alone is all my righteousness. And I want to be satisfied with him and the boundary that he appoints completely. And uh, I thank the Lord for doing that. And uh, I pray that it would be more and more true in the days ahead.